true person, it would be an uppercase. So that's one way of viewing it. And then in general English, you know, uh, when a when a capital is used in proper case, you're you're identifying a um, proper noun that is you know a, a specific uh, instance. And if you're using lowercase, you're just using it as a general noun. So if I'm talking about title in lowercase, I'm just talking about title, the concept. If I use title with a capital T, I'm referring to this particular title. So I hope that kind of answers the question. Yes, well, thank you, Frank. Um, the question are regarding bankruptcy. What takes place in bankruptcy court and who are the players uh, acting in what position? So uh, as far as the trustee, beneficiary, et cetera, during a bankruptcy court is the question. It's an excellent question. And uh, the, the, the straight honesty on this is that I have not studied the process of a bankruptcy court to give a qualified or educative answer to that question. Uh, so I'll take that on notice and whoever's asked that question, I will take some time between now and the next call to have a look and I ask that a question is, is put onto the forum and that those that have experience can share that information to the caller or the questioner on the forum to provide and I personally will go and have a look and see what I can find on that. But I, I don't have the knowledge to give a proper answer on the bankruptcy court. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Um, so what we can do is actually have a couple of options to either uh, email the question or and or put it on the forum so, so that others can get involved in helping to answer that question. Yeah, I think anything like that, I really encourage the forum as a direction rather than a, an email. Yeah. Okay. You can find that forum at university.ucadia.info online. So uh, go visit that and join in and so you can put your questions on the forums and that, that helps a lot. All right, back to uh, one song on the phone line. Hi Hello. there, Frank, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hi Frank, it's Max here. Hi Max. Um, my question to you would be uh, the trust ID card. Um, we're thinking of making them up uh, soon and we were just thinking about uh, raising the, the trust ID uh, I mean, the trust number raised like a credit card. What would you think about that? I mean, it's a great idea. Um, I know that there was an issue of just making sure that the most recent artwork is up, and I'm sorry for that. I'll, I'll actually make a note of that now and make sure that that's up um, in the next 24 hours. But I think that's a great idea. Um, and, look, And what do you think is, about a magnet? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Frank. Oh, um, keep going, no, keep going. I was just going to say about the magnetic strip at the back. Would you, uh, say, what would you think about that as well? Well, the, the idea of a magnetic strip is that, that over time, with the use of magnetic readers, um, see, people are developing f -plus and other things, and the technology of reader cards, and, and uh, if you think about a community, it gives options to people. So, so let's say that, that people, and this technology, by the way, is getting cheaper and cheaper, so let's say you've got people that can go and buy card readers for their community and they've got the cards. They could use that as their own um, uh, system between themselves as a network. So I think it's a great idea. But I, what I'd say is don't. there's a lot we can do, but you don't necessarily have to put all your eggs in one basket to start with, yeah? And if, okay. and if it's a... If it's a, a huge price difference or it's a huge time difference, then right now it, it's probably not needed to, to go the whole hog, if you, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I understand that. All righty. Okay, thanks, Frank. Good on you, Max. Very good. Thank you, Max. All right. Um, question from the chat. Uh, is there a way or should someone use some type of the EDP to the driver's license authority? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I'd say no. 
only because the notice to the vital statistics is about both emancipating and updating the system. What I would say to the DMV type ar arrangement is that we should be in a position that you can send a copy of that to the send a copy of what you've already done to the DMV. But I, I'm a great believer that if you if you are producing documents to a DMV, you're going to end up having people shut you down because they're, they're image trained and they're trained for lowest common denominator. Unless you're going to go to the the, the Secretary of Transportation then yes, an EDP at that level, at a state level, would be appropriate, but certainly not a DMV office. They wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. All right? Yeah, so could that be something that could be uh, um, included to the Secretary of State since they're normally over Department of Transportation or DMV? What are your thoughts on that, Frank? Yeah, I, I think it's important, and we have discussed this before. Mm -hmm. Now that we're, we, we, we have a, a, a focus on how to establish our claim of right, which is the EDP process, to the right appropriate area, there is every right then for us to presume, in spite of the dishonour, that we move ahead as a trustee holding our property. And there is no reason that we can't proceed with the Secretary of State of our particular state or the appropriate role, if you're in a non-US type state, to get your driver's license and other things updated on their system so that your trust number is connected and not your slave number uh, is connected. So I think that is something that we need to work on for, for everybody in parallel to what we're doing and I take on notice that that's something I need to come back and give some answer to. Because not just the Department of Transport, there's also passports, of course, a whole range of things. Now, you know, we don't need to go to the expense of going saying, here's our passport. What we want to do is, is, is show honour and say, you have a passport system. Your passport system's connected to everyone else in the world. Just make sure that our trust number is connected so you know that we are transacting under our trust number. And if you don't do that, then you force us to create our own passport. But I, I think we need to have some interim that helps people how to move forward on that to the appropriate person. So that's good. I'll put that on notice and I'll come back to you on that. Okay. That's great, Frank. Thank you. Uh, back to the phone with uh, Darlene. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Hey, um, I'm in the process of working on the UCC uh, financial statement, and um, when you're online, it doesn't allow you to um, put in, like, um, the brackets or the trust recipient number. You know, they want to identify you with your name. How can you go around that? don't know about the online UCC. Um, I, I tend to avoid that. I mean... Just like the IRS, the online IRS is only available to U.S. quote-unquote citizens. Um, it makes me nervous in that they are effectively boxing you in as a, as a citizen registering a UCC and not a trust registering a UCC. And the danger of doing it online is that if they don't allow you to differentiate that, then you are effectively being forced to commit an offence against the Uniform Commercial Code. So I'm actually even going to put down that I, I recommend not to lodge UCCs online. And we haven't made that explicit, but I will make it explicit not to register UCC online. I know it's an extra hassle. Um, I know it's an extra cost. But you've got to understand that they're not making it easy. They don't want to make it easy. But if you register online, the presumption is you're doing it as a Roman person and not as a trust. And that's 99% of the problem with UCC. Anyone that's gotten in trouble with UCC, it's because they did it as a Roman person. All right? So how important is it to have the bracket around your zip code? 
Not really. I mean, some people say, you know, brackets say it's not here. It, it's not really. Um, we use that because that's a convention that people have been using. But um, I, I still maintain that even with the brackets and on brackets, you're still dealing with an online service for people, for Roman persons, in their opinion, as opposed to a trust. So you shouldn't use the online service, even though it's quicker and easier, it actually identifies you wrongly compared to what you're doing. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, Frank, though, you've uh, got to have the brackets around the zip code. The zip code belongs to the federal zone and and to that venue and jurisdiction. And if our trusts are not involved in that venue and jurisdiction, which would be the case, because it's not a Roman person, it would be important to leave the brackets around the zip code. I agree. And, and the purpose of brackets in the legal system is that when something is covered by square brackets, you're saying that the thing that is in the brackets does not exist on the page. That's the formal right. meaning of the bracket, yeah. Well, I spoke with one of the agents, and they indicated that um, it will kick it out the system if you have the bracket. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I, I think the, the issue, though, is, is what we, we said. I mean, th that's a minor issue compared to using an online service that presumes you are a Roman person and not a trust. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Darlene. Okay, um, Central New Jersey, you're on the line. Yeah, hello? Hi. Hello. Yeah, how you doing? Um, uh, Frank, I, I had a quick question. Uh, I spoke to you last week, and I, and I emailed you, and uh, I know you had said you were, uh, you're in the process of preparing all the writs. Um, but my question is, uh, I, I need to send out an EDP, um, and I need to send out a writ of habeas corpus. Do I have to wait until the writs are done before I send out my EDP, or can I just send it now? No, no, no. You've got to, you cannot send a writ until you have perfected your ecclesiastical deed process. Okay. And by perfecting, I mean that you've reached the point of them being in dishonor and you've given notice of that dishonor. That's okay. what we mean by perfecting. Yeah, because at that point, you've, you, what you've done is you've asserted your claim okay. and you've defended your claim. Now, once you've defended your claim once, in our opinion, and in, you know, in maximum of law, right, you've right, perfected right. your claim. Yeah? Okay. All right, thank you so much. Good on you. All right, have a great night. You too. All right, very good. Thank you. All right, another question from the chat here. Uh, Frank, is there a reason, or at least give a um, fundamental reason why you call uh, people criminal, ins criminally insane or parasites? And... Um, is there a way to stop calling them that or just to at least give some sort of fundamental, factual reason why they're called that? Okay. Yes. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about... If, if someone... Let's talk about the insane part to start with and then we'll talk about the parasite part. If uh, you met someone and they said... <clears throat> Uh, well, let's let's take a, a practical example. Let's say there's a, 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 a general, and that general is, is is in charge of let's say nuclear weapons. And the day comes that it's discovered that that general, as a side issue, has been getting a cut of money from the banks as the banks steal people's homes. Let's just say that's a scenario. Uh, and when the general is confronted by this, the answer to the general is, if you try and remove me, I will launch the missiles. Now, that would be considered a, uh, an unreasonable and, and uh, deluded or, or um, um, mentally ill reaction because that general is not thinking through the consequences and it is disproportional to uh, what's been requested, which is simply not to continue to behave corruptly. So the criminally insane...